So hello everyone. Um, during We Have It Week, uh, one of the principles of digital development that we discussed was being data driven. Being data driven is of course very uh, important because data is becoming more and more present in our day to day lives and of course also in the projects that we um, implement. Um, after some discussions, we saw that there are a couple of basics that need to be covered when we want to work with data. Uh, accessibility of data, availability of data, the quality of data, both qualitative and quantitative, and also the reliability of the data. Those are the basics that we need to ensure that whatever data we have, we can gather and we can use, uh, also serves um, the purpose of making decisions. Um, apart from the basics that we had identified, a couple of our um, partners also mentioned the importance of clarifying data ownership. Where, um, who owns the data at what stage in the data value chain? And what we heard quite a lot is that the data value chain is often fragmented. Let me explain what I mean. By the time you go from collecting the data uh, on the field, let's say that a farmer uses data um, to, to better understand um, the quality of his plantation and the health of his trees, like we did with the Cajuna project in, uh, in, in Benin, implemented by TechnoServe, um, we see that there is some data being generated uh, there. Um, then it is passed on to the central authorities. They look at it, they analyze it, and uh, they, they, they also add additional layers if needed and filtering. Then it is sent to um, uh, local organizations that filter the data even more and actually translate the data from purely quantitative information to concrete, tangible uh, lessons and results, um, with which then the farmers again uh, are trained, um, and meaning that the data that was collected in the beginning of the field goes through an entire uh, circle before it arrives back uh, on that field or on that specific uh, uh, plantation, let's say, with the farmer, but in a totally different way. Now, in this example, we see already four steps, four interlocutors. And so the question is, of course, how do we make sure that um, when we have this, this circle of data going around, um, how do we ensure that the linkages between all those actors are, first of all, solid? Um, are they reliable? And is there not a risk of losing some elements uh, in translation almost um, every step um, of the way? So that was one of the, um, the risks that were identified and also the action points or points of retention even that were mentioned. Uh, second of all, when we talk about data and certainly personal data, uh, we also need to talk about data protection. Um, and there we see that more and more, our partners mentioned it, uh, we have more and more uh, frameworks and data policy acts and data protection acts being implemented uh, throughout Africa, of course. Uh, but it's one thing having these, uh, these this, this legal framework. Um, it's another thing also being able as a government to ensure compliance with, um, with um, what has been set in that legal framework. And compliance also means, of course, that the, uh, that, that the economy or the entire society need to be aware of what happens, first of all, to their data. And so that's mostly focusing on the citizens. On the other hand, companies, other organizations, universities, and so on, they need to understand what they can and cannot do with the personal data they have collected of certain uh, subjects um, in a specific country. So that's within a specific country. And then an additional challenge there is the cross-border data flow. Uh, if uh, personal data is shared between one country and another country, how do we first of all ensure that the legal frameworks are somewhat aligned or harmonized? And how can we actually trace the data that is being sent to another country or another part of the world and make sure that and that's in that place as well, it is compliant with uh, local um, data protection uh, customs and um, so that was the second one. What we also saw is that, I mean, it's very good to have data. Uh, it's very good to, to use data for decision making, but there's not really something you can do with data on its own. You need to analyze it, you need to visualize it, and then actually um, make the right conclusions. And in this sense, we, we heard with, with the partners that we discussed with uh, during the workshop that there's a question on, on the how. Um, how do we analyze this data, what are the best ways uh, to ensure a biased analysis, what are the best softwares, uh, statistical programs to use, and so on and so on. 
uh, and not only the how, but also the why. OK, what is the purpose of this analysis? Um, we're not analyzing data just for the sake of, of analyzing it. We have data, we have a certain objective, and we are going to use the data to make sure that we can reach that objective. Um, and, and that data will serve to inform all the uh, decisions that need to be taken or the actions that need to be undertaken um, on the way to achieving that specific uh, objective. Related to the why and then also to the bias and so on that I mentioned, uh, there was also the risk of data overload. Uh, data is everywhere, as I said in the beginning, data is everywhere. Um, but how do we make sure that we do not capture too much data? What do we do with the residual data um, and how do we how can we distinct um, useful data uh, from, let's say, additional data or metadata that is less, less, um, less important? Um, and I think there, uh, the selection of that data was uh, a point, an attention point or critical point mentioned by our partner projects. Um, and beyond the selection, it's also about uh, avoiding bias, so data bias, because even in the selection phase of your data, when you have an objective of if you want to prove or not a hypothesis, there is a risk of bias already in the selection of the data. And that was something that was also mentioned. And there needs to be some sort of clarity or a clear framework for that um, to ensure that people do not fall or organizations do not fall into the trap of biased data and um, uh, have the tendency to uh, formulate hypotheses that are that have the tendency themselves to be confirmed by the data that is uh, selected. So how do you cope with this? How do you cope with biased analysis? And also in that sense, how as an organization that is often dependent on, on, on a partner or on a donor, um, how do you present negative uh, results? Um, if you want to avoid bias, you also need to take into account negative results, but it, it requires a bit of thinking and a bit of um, uh, a bit of. Um, uh, well, let me start again. So how do you cope with uh, presenting negative data, for instance, to partners or to donors? Because if you have uh, if you analyze or if you select your data, there is this tendency, of course, to select only those elements that actually confirm your hypothesis. Um, it's a tendency I think we're all confronted with. Um, but how do you cope with this negative data? How, how, how do you cope with presenting a donor, for instance, um, a, an analysis of a data set that has not been treated in a way that it has a biased outcome, but it presents a clear and transparent and re real picture <clears throat> of what actually happened on the ground? So that's uh, an important one and still a question that is pending also with our partner projects. <clears throat> and then this relates, of course, to um, so um, presenting negative data or um, avoiding uh, biased analysis of data also leads us to the question of accountability versus being data driven, because organizations might have the tendency uh, to look only at accountability, or even the donors actually have a tendency only to look at, so let's say, the rock frames and the quantitative data, and they will only look at the, the results. Um, the thing is, of course, if you are data driven, or if your project is data driven, you need to use all the data that is available, or at least and the, the relevant data, including the negative parts or including the data that might lead to negative results or, or negative uh, analysis that's possible. Why? Because it's only when you do, when you, when you work with uh, transparent analysis um, that you can actually see what problems might occur, why challenges, um, what, what challenges might have, have occurred, and also act accordingly to mitigate any risks that have popped up to um, defy any challenges uh, that came up and so on. And so therefore, um, using data and avoiding a biased analysis of data and also using negative data is very important um, because it's only then that we are going to um, understand where the problem is, what caused the problem and how um, the project or an organization can act uh, in order for this problem to be solved. I think that's it. Thank you.